Please welcome to the stage our next panel on becoming a change agent, embracing your experiences to better your community. Paula Mendoza, filmmaker, activity, and former artistic director of, for the Women's March on Washington. Sarah Sophie, founder and creative director of, of the Citizens Band, activity, national organizer for the Women's March, and author of Together We Rise, and moderated by Michaela Angela Davis, writer and image activist. Um, I'm just gonna, we're just gonna jump in. Yeah. We don't have that much time, and time is, um, these are crazy times. So I just want to start off by asking you both how you defined an activist, because I've heard it defined as one that takes on the challenge of their time. Mm -hmm. how, how do you define being an activist? What is being an activist? Well, Alice Walker said, mm -hmm. activism is the rent we pay for living on this planet. I'm paraphrasing. Um, and that seems about right to me. I mean, for me, it's always just been if there's something that I can't live with myself if I don't show up for, mm -hmm. then you just got to show up for it. And if there's no leadership there, then you fill the vacuum um, or you find somebody um, who's an expert in that field to to fill that vacuum. So I'm gonna ask you a question to unpack that a little bit. Yes. Because if you are, you're a mother, you've got kids, you've got a career, you've got a house, you've got issues, you've got, you know, the, well let's assume that you have a boss. <laughs> Cause you know, you're the boss of yourself. I know her. She's my boss. She's <laughs> All right, so you and, and this is very specific to, I think, this, this audience. How do you access this idea of there's something I can't live with because your living is so complicated mm -hmm. and there's so much work to be done, so many demands, so many things you're just trying to check off. How do you access that thing that you just described? We talked about this on the phone, but I think everyone has a fire in them. Every human is, it comes here with something that can burn mm -hmm. beautifully. However, everyone's life does not give them permission mm -mm. to get there. Mm -hmm. the, the journey to even get to what this thing is that you care about. How, how, did, you get, how did you get to your place? And, and you're gonna answer that same question too. I mean, I would say first and foremost, it's a privilege and I understand that um, I can do the work I do and I can do it on a volunteer or for not a lot of money because I come from a real place of privilege. My husband is a director and makes a lot of money. And, um, you know, and I would also say that, you know, my kids are not always happy with me. And, we, and, and when they voice that um, unhappiness, I stop what I'm doing and I show up for them. Mm -hmm. um, but it, I think just because of the way was raised, this is something I've always been doing on some level, so um, there was never a real choice for me, I don't think. You um, know, I think, to go back to your original question and, and also answer this, I think ultimately what it comes down to is compassion. Mm -hmm. And I feel that we are lost, and we've been lost before in this country, we've been lost since the beginning of time in this country, but we are lost in this moment in particular, I believe, because we have lost our compassion. Mm -hmm. I often say that uh, America is suffering from a mass contraction of the heart. Mm -hmm. and, and I think that so much is, can be put underneath that umbrella, not just in this moment in time, mm -hmm. but throughout time of this country. And, and so one of the things that I, I instill in my son, and, and I get asked this question a lot, Sarah Sophie does too, because we have children during, and we're both very active, and how do we talk to our children, and, and how do we raise feminist sons, and how do we raise activist sons, feminist daughters, and I always go back to this idea of compassion, the most important value that I can instill in my son, who's five at this time, is compassion, and it's something that we nurture, it's something that we shine a light on, it's something that we explain. Because if we have a foundation of compassion, then I think inevitably you will become an activist. You will be an activist in your own right. My activism is very different 
from my neighbor's activism, which is very different from, you know, uh, Jess Morales, who's at the head of Families Belong Together and working with uh, family separation, but our activism ultimately is rooted in, in compassion. So, role play with me a little bit. I'm mm -hmm. your son. Mm -hmm. How do you explain compassion? Because we hear words like that, compassion, empathy, and often, we don't know what they mean mm -hmm. and how, again, this, this idea of accessing these, um, our humanity mm -hmm. in such demanding times. Mm -hmm. So how, how would you um, define compassion? So a perfect example. I think you speak, I speak from values to my son. So mm -hmm. we live in Fort Greene. Oh God, I hope this isn't being streamed. Um, it is. Listen. It is oh being streamed. Okay. <laughs> this is the so, time to be sugar free. We don't have time. Listen. Uh, no, I'm talking about other reasons for that. But point okay. is, is that we live in a place, we live in a place that um, has a, a homeless center shelter a few blocks away. So we have mm -hmm. a lot of homeless people on our street. Mm -hmm. So from a very young age, Mateo would always ask, you know, like, why is that person doesn't have any shoes on? And we would say, well, that person doesn't have a home. Why don't they have a home? They don't have a home because they don't have enough money for a home. Mm -hmm. And instead of shunning them, mm -hmm. we would say, you know, but it's important to be nice to them. It's important mm -hmm. to be respectful to them. If you have food, you give it to them. Mm -hmm. So Mateo now at five, he sees a homeless person. We were in Greece, actually. Mm -hmm. There was a man who was homeless. And Mateo, we had just left from a restaurant. Mateo mm -hmm. was carrying his fish and he walked by the man. And he saw and he turned around and he said, Daddy, do you think that man's hungry? And he was like, yeah, I think so. He's like, I'm going to give him my fish. And he went and he gave him his fish completely on his own. And I think it's because we're able to talk about it and we're able to humanize a homeless person versus that homeless person, don't talk to them. They're scary. Mm -hmm. They're on drugs. Cross the street when you see them. We don't say that um, and we, we make them a human being. So let's take that example and move it into a workplace. And instead of being a homeless person, it's an issue. It's mm -hmm. racism, it's sexism, it's microaggressions, it's, um, you know, the, the kind of things that, that particularly as women, and often women of color are navigating, and those, those, those navigations slow us down to mm -hmm. our actual potential or, at, or yes. getting to real work. And I think that's one of the things that's so difficult often to explain to people who are not women or and who are not women of color, the amount of, of shape shifting mm -hmm. and the energy that that takes and what how that keeps you from even getting to a place of compassion or moving things forward. So instead of talk, talking about a, you know giving someone a fish, how do you how do you explain? Because you're doing this in Tennessee, you just I just spilled some tea, but um, <laughs> you know you're working with people, helping them understand how to get active politically when they've not really experienced this kind of Fort Greene life. How do, so how do you do, how do you explain to people who want to be, who want to do good work but have no idea, mm. don't know what the issues are, don't know how to access them? I mean, I, I want to go back to the kid thing just for a second mm -hmm. to say that I think there are age appropriate ways to talk to your kids about almost everything. You know, in my household, because we come from a privileged place, we talk about privilege. But when you bake that in to your everyday conversation, whether it's race, gender, you know, disability, whatever it is, xenophobia, um, it's not like you have to be explaining something mm -hmm. because it's so ingrained in what we talk about every day. Mm -hmm. And that doesn't mean that we're perfect, and I think especially with boys, there's no roadmap, and that's something I'm really keen on working on. Mm. But um, in general, uh, you know, it makes it easier, so when you get into the workplace situation, you know, we're, a lot of us in this room are probably raising the next generation of people. Like, we wanna raise a generation of people that know how to walk into that workplace situation mm -hmm. and, um, either lead on it or be the best that they can be to, to make those situations less, you know, uh, occurring less and less. Mm -hmm. So um, I guess I am gonna spill a little tea. Okay. Children, children, like Mateo, like the, your children are beautiful. Adults sometimes are like, ugh. Yeah. You know, like, yeah. so. You know, they are, and you all, and particularly coming from the Women's March, there are so many different kinds of women, so many different kinds of people coming from so many different experiences. 
and we don't have a lot of common education yeah. about this country. We don't have a lot of common education. So it's how do you do this with adults that are coming at it with so many different levels of um, misinformation, no information, right. fear, all that stuff? I mean, I think you have to meet people where they're at. Mm. So, you know, for example, I'm watching this race in Tennessee, the Senate race. It's real close. Like, we can flip this seat. Like, we can do it. And I'm reaching out to all my friends. I have a lot of friends in Nashville. I've been reaching out. Mm -hmm. I'm not getting a lot of traction. I'm feeling a lot of confusion and sort of pushback. And to be honest, m the majority of them are white women with huge social media platforms. So um, I realized, okay, me just reaching out isn't enough, right? I need to model this for mm -hmm. them. So. I had a bit of a rage spiral this morning, <laughs> and I got on the email. I emailed everyone I know who um, I've got. I've been getting out the vote with a group of people since 2004, mm. and emailed all my friends who, we, who I've knocked doors with in the past, and I said, does anyone want to go to Nashville? These are the days that we're looking to go. And it was interesting because what I realized is I got to meet them where they're at. They are mm. not ready to, to take the reins on this. They, and I've explained it, I've handheld, but they're just not ready. So we're gonna go model it for them. And then, you know, the next in two years, they can lead on this, you know? And, and I don't think that's, you know, I think we're hearing so much conversation around specifically white women and the 53% of white women who voted for Trump. And we're hearing a lot of, um, you know, and I'm the only white woman on this stage, so white women go get your girls. And I don't necessarily know that many people that voted for Trump, but one thing I can do is I can activate everybody who I have access to. And um, I don't blame them. It's a little scary to knock doors, so we're gonna go do yeah. it together, throw some fundraising parties, and that's what wait, we're gonna do. Wait, is that a t-shirt, white women go get your girls? No, but it should be. Okay, so wait a minute. Done. This is live streaming, so everyone knows that Sarah Sophie said it first. Uh, and I think we better get those. Wait, no, I, because it came from you first. Oh. Because you. Oh, probably. So this, and this is a conversation you and I have been in since before the election. We yeah. were lucky enough, we're lucky enough to be friends with Rebecca Traster. Mm -hmm. And a conversation the three of us have been having, you know, since the 2016 election is you know, exactly this, like how do we do this? And what you said to us after a podcast we all did together mm -hmm. was, what are the white men doing? You guys need to go get your boys. Yes. So, so <laughs> I, think, I, think, I think we need to get our boys, we need to get our girls, we need to get our people, because we gotta win this thing. But I think something that's really important that you were, mm -hmm. that you were asked about was this idea of, you know, and Sarah answered, you know, we have to meet people where they're at. So one of my experiences on that has been very specific around, I do a lot of work on immigration, and so there recently, within the past five years, has been a transition in language mm. that we refer to people that don't have papers in this country as undocumented and not as illegal. Um, and I have been in various situations big rooms, intimate dinners, four-on-four -four conversations with friends, with strangers, where people actually use the word that they're not supposed to anymore. Mm -hmm. And because I come from this space, I always think it's my responsibility to correct people. But I've been able to do that correction in a way that um, doesn't humiliate, mm -hmm. doesn't embarrass, doesn't make people, they feel bad because they're always like, oh, shit, I just got checked. But it's coming from a place of love, mm -hmm. and it's coming from a place of education. And so why I say that is, is I think me personally, where I meet, I, I am happy to sit down, not happy, mm -hmm. I am open to sitting down with people that are not at a level of where I would like them to be if their intentions are in the right place and yet mm -hmm. are miseducated, don't have access, are lazy, aren't educated, mm -hmm. um, and have that conversation with them. But that's me. There's other people that are too exhausted, that don't want to do it, that have been doing it for 30 years, and today they don't want to do it, and that's totally fine as well. Mm -hmm. But I think that just as we have to meet people where, where they are at, we, and my mentor said this, we also have a responsibility, those that are conscious, to hold the hand of people as they walk through the door of consciousness. Mm -hmm. And I think that that is an image that, that I, I constantly remind myself of, even when I'm exhausted, even when I'm tired, even when I'm just fed up with people. Um, because that, that is my personal journey as well. So how do you take care of yourself? 
when you're meeting all these people where they at? Because some people are in some like whack places. Yeah, and some people are just too whack. You just don't even mess with them. Yeah, like, there's yeah, that yeah, part, yeah, yeah. right? Like you have to, you know, yeah. no one to throw up the Wakanda. But um, <laughs> it's very helpful. Very. <laughs> Not just, but this I, it, it is a, a exhausting, and um, you know, and I was talking to Sally outside, and we were talking about just re the, the resistance. Um, that you can get from even folks that you think that you're working in service of. Mm -hmm. And I said something to her that I was like, you know, there are times that you're just taking one for the t for your ancestors, taking one from mm -hmm. the team. Like if it's if you think it's hard for you to hear someone correct you mm -hmm. from with a, a word, if you think that's hard, imagine those invisible mm -hmm. women that are, you know, cleaning up at, at the office. Mm -hmm. All those invisible women that have done this work, that have gone through <coughs> unimaginable. So if you can see, and that's kind of to this empathy piece, right? Particularly is when we can do this, it's not easy. I mean, mm -hmm. even a after the, we're friends because I didn't want to let you go, and I didn't want to let Rebecca Traster know, and I was mad. I was so mad. I was like, I'm so mad at you. Like, where is that? That was one of the but most transformative. It was after the election. After so the you election. All know, and I love you so much yeah. for sending that text. Well, but that. part of it is what you just said. It's like understanding that people's intentions are, are good. They may be, it's almost like your children. Like, you yes. know that they want to, but they just don't know. <laughs> so how do you do that in, inside of a workplace, and I want to be very specific again to this to this conversation, inside of the workplace where it's not a beautiful little boy, but it's like a old mm -hmm. guy, you know, <laughs> an old white guy. Because giving up supremacy and privilege mm -hmm. and advantage is a really big ask, yeah. and they they do not know how to move over, get out of the way, yeah. understand. Like, how, so how do you? meet people where they're at and they're and where they're at is um this white patriarchal supremacist homophobic place because mm -hmm. you can't oh does this work yeah you can't go nine to five yeah. we should all rewatch nine to five i swear right. but, <laughs> but um I think it's a bunch of things. Mm -hmm. it, one thing you said made me think of something that i say to parents a lot but i think it extends to when we're tired is you know, in talking to your kids, I think that if there are children all over the world who are tolerating family separation mm -hmm. and their siblings being shot down by police or being arrested or whatever it is, our children can certainly tolerate a conversation and they can certainly tolerate showing up for some stuff that they may not always want to show up for. And I think as far as this moment in time goes, because we're certainly more exhausted, I'd say, even than we normally are, um, it, same thing goes for adults, I think. And, you know, one thing I would say, like, in a workplace situation, the funny thing is, like, and this is also complicated, like, I don't work with men that much. So, you know, that's not necessarily a situation I find myself in. But I do know that you know, if, if there's a situation where somebody does something inappropriate, says something racist, makes whatever it is, um, because I'm oftentimes the person who will suffer the least from saying something, the onus is on me for to say something. And I think especially, you know, in dealing with men and around this Me Too movement, what you said about this unwillingness to... Um, give up power or even just change the rules midstream, you know, because that's basically what we're doing. There's rules that we all live by and that we're all complicit in, I think. Mm -hmm. um, I think similar, similarly, you've got to meet them where they're at and you've got to, you know, and it's exhausting. The amount, I mean, I, I imagine most women in this room have experienced this lately, like, the amount of patience and hand-holding and skirting around something to get into something that we've all been having to do to speak to the men in their lives is a bummer, but I just think it's necessary, and I wish I had a 
if, if anyone has a better solution, like please mm -hmm. tell me, but I think that's kind of it. So, so this idea of how do you take care of yourself in this moment, because you can't, mo you can't be in a movement if you get to the yeah. point where you can't move. What, what are some of the, the tactics um, that you do just in terms of self-care and sisterhood? Right. And, you know, fostering that. You know, this, I'm an immigrant and immigrants have been hated for a very long time in this country, but in particular the last three years have been very, very hard for immigrants. Um, this summer, so I'm just trying, I'm pretty strong is what I'm trying to say, but this summer mm -hmm. with family separation, mm -hmm. that broke me. Mm -hmm. it, it literally like busted me open and I didn't know how to deal with that concept and idea of family separation and what it was doing with me emotionally. I was still working every day and yeah. I, was, I was battling on the front lines with a lot of amazing women um, and this concept of, okay, well, how am I gonna take care of myself because I'm really in a bad place, I'm really fucked up. Mm -hmm. um, started kind of replaying in my head and figuring it out and I think it also goes to the question that you were talking about. Well, I, I had to figure out how do I take care of my heart? How do I literally protect my heart? It didn't mean stop doing the work because I couldn't, but what are the things that needed me to allow, what, 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 what could those things be? So Sarah and I started a, a course called the Resistance Revival Course, which gen genuinely brings me a lot of joy. Mm -hmm. It's very important. Um, also, I just started hiking. I started like hanging out with my son, mm -hmm. stopped reading the newspaper or whatever, not even the newspaper, my phone after 9 p.m., like doing those small strategies. things, mm -hmm. strategies to protect my heart, I'm in a much better place now, mm -hmm. which is good because family separation 2.0 is just around the corner, y'all, so get ready for that one. Mm -hmm. um, but that's just what we have to be able to do and identify, as well as when you're in a place, a white man or whatever it is, your coworker is a nasty person, you can't have a conversation with them, you also have to protect mm -hmm. your heart. You don't have to keep putting yourself out there for someone that's not gonna listen, for someone that is uninterested in sharing space, is uninterested in changing the rules midstream, and mm -hmm. that's okay, and that doesn't mean that you have to be a martyr for those people. It means that you have to protect your heart and have compassion. And it's that word that we constantly hear that but we don't really know how to deal with it is balance. We have to find a balance, a healthy balance mm -hmm. for it. And you know, I, I've gotten to the, you know, being a grown ass woman, it, you know, <laughs> that's, that's, that's how I phrase this part of my life now. I'm just grown ass. Um, <laughs> this idea, I've actually kind of given up this notion of, of reaching balance, um, mm -hmm. that there is, you know, I, it, gets, it gets more balanced or that there's some kind of, there's, I can see a kind of center. And I'm actually energized by the, the notion that my life is dynamic and things mm -hmm. are gonna change and into, you know, lots of intersectionality forever. But if, if we could just spend these last couple of minutes, um, again, getting to this notion that there is a specific thing in us. There's a specific calling and fire that is in us that we can do in big and small. You all do huge things. You mm -hmm. move masses of people. But all of us can do little things in mm -hmm. our community, in our house, in our workplace that collectively it can really shift. Mm -hmm. It can shift this whole conversation if everyone did a little thing. You all kept following and it got bigger and bigger. How, how can you, so if you could kind of get it in a minute, this notion of tending to the fire inside of you to lead you to do work that's in service of others, because that's really what we're talking mm -hmm. about, right? Like, how do we use this, this thing that's mm. in all of us, that's specific, that moves the humanity forward. And I feel like if we're going to get out of this shit, women are going to do it. So y'all, oh, sure. we all got we all got to go get our girls. Mm -hmm. Although it would be great if men would show up because we're tired. Yeah, but you know, but but you know what? <laughs> they, like they, they had a good run. It. <laughs> look what like look what's happening with, with yeah, this. With this, I'm just saying show up, you know, whatever. We <laughs> did a call the, her part, Paula's partner did a call for men during the Kavanaugh, the last day of the Kavanaugh hearings. Got thousands of retweets on Twitter. There was a sign-up page. I kept going and checking that sign-up mm -hmm. page. It went from five people to 20 people, you know, and, and eventually 25 men got arrested and that was awesome, but we need more men to show up. Um, I, you know, I would, I would just say talk to your kids. Mm -hmm. If you have kids, talk to them 
Um, and little things like do a phone banking party. If you know how to arrange a birthday party, you know how to arrange a phone banking party. I mean, I'm speaking specifically to the midterms, but mm -hmm. show up for communities outside your own. If there's a rally, if there's a march, put your body there. You don't have to say anything, just show up. Mm. You know, um, that, those are two things I can think of. Well, I think the idea of tending to the fire mm -hmm. during these times, um, there is a self-responsibility to find out what you can do. There is nothing that Sarah Sophie or Michaela or myself can tell you to go out and do. You, there is a self-responsibility to organizing as well, to, to showing up for people, to showing up for yourself. But with that, the tending of the fire for me mm -hmm. in the summer when I was most broken, um, I went back to this idea that I had been talking about a lot um, and I hadn't really had to like put it to the test. Mm. And the idea was that um, I want to and have been organizing out of a place of love. So in the darkest and the hardest of moments, mm -hmm. the thing that needed to get me out of bed, the thing that, that needed to make me make that call or go out on the street or, or, or think of a creative idea was love, right? And um, this summer, like I said, it was, a, it was a test that I've never had before because I was so filled with anger and rage. And I don't think that anger and rage are negative. I think that they all, it has its place. But that was the thing that was leading me in that moment in the summer. And I, I recognize that as not being healthy for me and not being sustainable for me because rage has a limit. Mm -hmm. And love, on the other hand, is in, it, it's infinite. Love gives you strength and, and for, in, for, for forever. So I really um, was able to put into practice this theory that I had, which was to organize, organize out of a place of love. And, and ultimately, that is what tends the fire inside of me. It's, it's love for immigrants, because mm -hmm. I am an immigrant, and I am so inspired mm -hmm. by immigrants, and my mom, and the women that are like my mom that have sacrificed so much. It's love for this country, even though I actually didn't know that I loved this country mm -hmm. until it was slipping from my grasp, because as all relationships have love, that have love in them, they are complicated. My relationship with this country is very complicated. It's love for democracy, mm -hmm. and truth, and, and equity, and those are the things that, um, get me out of bed in the darkest of moments, light my fire, and if you also can find that inside of you, truly dig for that, I think that there's no way that you then won't go out and help your neighbor and help your stranger and stand up for the black person that's being accused of something because they just like decided to have a barbecue, whatever it is, right? All of the injustices that we see. So, so that is the thing that lights the fire for me. Well, I love you, ladies. Yay! Yay! And um, I w uh, thank you to the uh, She Summit for basically letting me sit up here and talk to two women that I adore and I miss, and just like having a girl chat. We do this at home. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so um, thank you all, and please, you all know what to do in these next couple of days. Go out and do. Yes, go out and do it. Um, Thank you, Paula. Thank you, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.